what an honor it is for me to be with you here today in this honorable memorial event. To stand here and to look out at all of these markers and to know that underneath each one of those lie the earthly remains of someone to whom life and liberty was more important than was life itself. We need to honor them, always remember them. To each and every person that has served in the service in the past, serving now, or will serve in the future, there will be one particular event that will live in their minds almost every second of every day and even a good part of the night. For me, that event happened 70 years ago this past Wednesday at, on December 7th, 1941 at Pearl Harbor. I am honored to stand before you today, not only as a living reminder of that event, but also I am honored to stand, be here as a standing and speaking representative of over 2,400 other military individuals who, because of that event, have been unable to stand or to speak for themselves for over 70 years past. Also, I stand before you in remembrance of over 80,000 other military individuals, Navy, Marine Corps, Army, Army Air Corps, Coast Guard, who, like myself, survived that event, but have themselves since passed on. I was in an upper level office on the southeast end of Air Aerial Patrol Squadron VP-23's hangar, Building 54, on the harbor inland end of Fort Island in the center of Pearl Harbor on the morning of December 7, 1941. Suddenly I, I heard the sound of an approaching aircraft, but that's not unusual because we're a naval air station, airplanes come and go, but this was a Sunday morning and usually not so much activity on a Sunday. Suddenly and almost simultaneously, there was this tremendous roar, bomb fragments, explosion debris, and window glass came crashing into the back of my head, ears, neck, and onto my shoulder. Thinking one of our air group pilots was doing a little hot dogging, I hadn't pulled out and up in time and had crashed into our building, I'm going to go down and see if I can be of some help. I got up and ran down to the lower level, went out the narrow opening left at the end of the rolling hangar door, the roar of another aircraft. I looked up and here comes this other aircraft in a steep power dive. I'm seeing what looked like flashing or blinking lights on the front of that airplane. I'm hearing strange popping, buzzing and whizzing sounds all about me. And I'm a recent farm boy. I've never been to war before, and I don't recognize them for what they are. Later, I was told that what I thought was flashing and blinking lights were the machine gun muzzle flashes on the front of that airplane, and those strange popping, buzzing, and whizzing sounds were those bullets striking and ricocheting off the hangar door right behind me and off the concrete apron on which I was standing. Suddenly, my attention was drawn to a big old bomb hanging there on the bottom of that fuselage between the fixed landing gear of that old Val dive bomber. Suddenly that bomb released, it wobbled as it began to fall, that airplane began to pull out of its dive. By the time it was in level flight, it couldn't have been much more than 100, 150 feet over my head. It's then when I first saw and recognized that big round red insignia on the bottom of the starboard wing. That and the fact that it has just dropped a bomb has convinced this ex-country boy that these are not the friendly fellows that I thought they might be. 
I hurried back inside the hangar hoping I could find someone with a key of the ammo shack so we could get some guns and ammo and put up a little bit of a defense. As I came in that front door, most of the other few people that I was on duty with there that morning were heading out the back door. Somebody, I suppose the duty officer, saw me and he said, hey, you, follow me. So I went after him. They ran out that back door, jumped into an unfilled construction ditch out behind the hangar. I jumped in after them. When I hit the bottom of that ditch and kind of got myself together, I'm looking right at a guy sitting there in his white uniform, the Liberty uniform, the dress uniform, the work uniform is those blue bell-bottom dungaree trousers and a blue chambray shirt, and I'm wondering what he's doing there in a white uniform. But I'm so thankful that he was, because there on the left, sleeve of that uniform was a petty officer's rating badge, and I recognized that wing round cannonball that was the insignia of an aviation ordinance. I said, you're the duty ordinance, man. you got to keep an ammo shack. Yeah, well, let's go get some guns and shoot these blankety blankety blanks, you know. <laughs> so, boy, we sh I no more got to the bottom of the ditch, and I'm back up out of the ditch again. Somebody shout, get back in the ditch, get back in the ditch. We're military men. We should be putting up a defense. We shouldn't be in the ditch. Besides, I'm from a proud family. I know this is the beginning of that war that they've been talking about and that we've been training for. And I damn well know that if I'm going to lose my life in this battle or any other battle of this war, I would want my family and my country to know that I died fighting, not hiding. Yeah. <laughs> We continued up out of that ditch, started to run for the ammo shack. Then I heard the strangest command directed at me that I ever heard in all my time in the Navy. Somebody, and I suppose the duty officer, shouted, Get back in the ditch or I'll put you on report for disobeying the direct order. With total disregard for the threat of military discipline, with total disregard for the fact that aerial bombs, machine gun bullets were raining down in the area where the ammo shack was. We continued to run. We made it to the ammo shack. The ordinance went out, locked the door, let himself in. I'm right behind him. He said, what do you want? Give me a 50 caliber machine gun. Now, I'm a recent farm boy. The biggest gun I'm used to firing is a shoulder-fired 22 caliber rifle. Now, I'm talking about a fixed mount 50 caliber machine gun. Man, it looked to me like a cannon without wheels. But I took it as best I could, maybe cradled it in my arm, turned around, and thankfully some others had now followed us. The guy right behind me was at least a head taller than I was, huskier built. I'm only about, you know, 145 pounds at that time, I guess. Anyway, I just offloaded to him and I said, here, take this, take this to the PBY, Park and Putter 23's hangar. I'll get the ammo. Man, he grabbed that gun, looked surprised, but he took it and out the door he went. I turned around there again. I'm so thankful for that, I, that ordinance man, because he was just setting two canisters of 50 caliber ammo off on the counter. I grabbed those two canisters, turned out the door I went. Now, I'm not a runner or a sprinter, but I guarantee you, I beat the guy with the gun to that airplane. <laughs> Now, we were coming from the southeasterly direction or the port side of the airplane, the same direction that the attacking aircraft were coming from. But the ladder to get into that airplane was hanging from the starboard blister around the back side of the airplane. I ran over, set those two canisters down, started up the ladder. I don't think I got more than about two or three rungs when it dawned on me, if you get up inside this airplane, are you going to be able to reach down and pull that heavy old gun up inside? I don't think so. So, boy, I jumped back off that ladder just as the guy with the gun got there. I said, here, give it to me. You get up inside the airplane. Boy, he went up and jumped inside, turned around. I got that gun to him, most likely muzzle first. That's the lightest end, which, of course, is a safety no-no. But I don't think either one of us were worried about personal safety right at that time. I grabbed the canister that I had on one hand and guided myself up the ladder with the other, set it inside the fuselage, back down, got the other one back up, set it inside, jumped in, picked those two canisters up, stepped across the other side of the fuselage just as he swung that machine gun out and locked it into firing position. I set those canisters down under the gun, flipped the lid open, come up with a belt, ready to load. He's just standing there looking skyward. I looked up and here comes another one of those airplanes. Those same old blinking lights. Now I'm only hearing popping sounds when I was later told were those bullets passing through the fuselage of that airplane. The same old big old mom hanging there on the bottom. Boy, I couldn't wait for him to regain his composure. I just reached over, slid the lock forward, threw the breech open, 
fed the end of the belt into the loading mechanism. Slam. Whoa. <laughs> I'm back at war. Slam the. <laughs> I slammed the breech shut, grabbed the charging lever, pulled it back, let it go. Bang. We got around in the chamber. Shoot, I shouted. Then he pulled the trigger. And I stood there and watched those bullets, those tracer bullets, go through empty space where that airplane had just been. I think that's when my country boy hunter instinct took over. I used to shoot jackrabbits on the run, Chinese ringneck peasants on the fly, not with a shotgun, with a 22 caliber rifle. It would oft times make the, mean the difference back there in the country, in Minnesota, in the late 20s and through the 30s, it would mean the difference of whether you did or did not have food on the table. I said, let me get the next one. He let that gun down, stepped aside. I picked it up and brought it up. There's another one coming down. The same old blinking white, big old bomb. Boy, I got a bead and a lead. A bead and a lead. And I squeezed that trigger. And I continued to lead in the fire. When I couldn't raise that gun any higher, I still continued to fire until the fuselage of that airplane had passed just overhead. Now I watched those tracer bullets fly through the air. And it looked like every one of them went right into that round opening on the front of that old radial engine aircraft and then stitched a stitch right down the bottom of the fuselage. Now you gotta know and you gotta remember that following each one of those tracer bullets there are four regular bullets. Another tracer, four more regular bullets. So I know here and I know here that I did some damage to that aircraft. But you're not gonna be worried about him because You're not going to be worried about him because he's going away. You better be looking for the next guy that's coming at you. And I'm, I'm looking up there for another one in a dive. I don't see any more in a dive, but there, there. Out over the channel comes another one. He's not in a dive, but he's in a steep banking left descending turn as though he's getting ready to make another run on us. And because he's in a bank like that, I can see the cockpit. It's about six or eight feet behind the front of that airplane. I figure if I use the front of that airplane as my aiming point, I'm going to get a few rounds into that fuselage. And leave you me, if you can get a couple of 50 caliber machine gun bullets bouncing around inside that cockpit with that pilot, you're going to give him something else to think about besides coming back and machine gunning you a second time. I continued that lead and I squeezed the trigger. Brrr, gone, you know. Anyway, when I did that and I saw a couple of those tracer bullets disappear into that fuselage. And when they did, he did an abrupt rolling right turn and was gone from my field of fire. Sixty years later, sixty years later, I was watching a television broadcast from Pearl Harbor and they then were interviewing some of the pilots, Japanese pilots, that had actually participated in that raid, and they had asked them back there. And they asked this one, they said, well, what part did you play on the raid? Now listen to this. He said, I was the lead pilot of a group of nine aircraft. Our assigned target were the airplanes and the hangars on Ford Island. That's where I was. He said, when I went in for my first run, machine gun, dropped my bomb, I didn't see a soul. It was like the whole island was asleep. But he said, by the time I came around and was lining up for my second run, there was so much fire coming up that I turned and went elsewhere. There's the guy that dropped the very first bomb to fall at Pearl Harbor that morning. There's the guy that dropped the bomb that got to me physically, spilt of my blood. Surely some of the first, if not the very first, to fall at Pearl Harbor that morning. But I think in spite of that, I'm the, one of the guys at least that got to him with that defensive machine gun fire and changed his mind about coming back and getting us the second time. Anyway, I've often thought... <laughs> I've often thought back and wondered, you know, like when he came in the first time, all the rest of those other eight planes followed him, dropped their bombs, machine gun. If he had have came back the second time, it's most likely the rest of them would have followed him. And if they had, who's to say that one of them wouldn't have moved over a hundred feet and machine gunned that ditch where all those guys were hiding? And if they had, how many fatalities, how many injuries would they have been? Could we, even under the threat of military discipline, been the ones who may have saved his britches?
I don't know, but it's possible. Anyway, I am so honored to stand before you here today with all of you patriotic people. I'm, I'm, I'm so, so grateful. And I would hope that all of my sunken shipmates are looking down on this ceremony here today. And I hope that I am able to represent them as well as I have always hoped that I could. I have had a, a dream that someday I would be able to do something with. I have had a vision that I hoped that someday would maybe come true. And I have made promises to fallen or past comrades, shipmates, and family members or friends like many of you may have had. And today, here, with your help, I am living that dream. That vision has came true, and I have fulfilled that promise. I am so honored. I was under the impression that there was going to be a Buffalo soldier with us here today. And also a member of the Tuskegee Airmen. I don't think uh, they were. Huh? I don't think he was here. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I was, I was going to feel that it would be such an honor, such an honor to be in their presence, because those, those truly are legendary people. And with your permission, could I, could I make believe just a little bit here today? Absolutely. Sir. All right. Let us just. All of us here today that are standing in remembrance of our fallen comrades, let us just for a moment pretend that we can reach out you know, to all of those other people throughout the country who are participating in similar events today. Let's just pretend that we can reach out across the width and the length of this great nation, this great land. And with appreciation for each and every one involved, let them know that it would be an honor to shake their hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.